Good morning from UC Berkeley, California, where we are over the moon with the news that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded to Dr. Jennifer Doudna and her colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier. Wanted to let you know that we are gonna spend the next hour or so talking to our esteemed guests, Carol Chris, Michael Botchen, Douglas Clark, and of course, Jennifer Doudna. But a bit of news before that. We are now confirming that Jennifer is the first first woman on our faculty to ever win a Nobel Prize. That, as the campus celebrates 150 years this year of women at the university. Additionally, we are also celebrating the news yesterday that this campus and our colleagues down at UCLA shared in the Nobel Prize in physics. Joining me this morning is Chancellor Carol Chris, Michael Botchen, Dean of Biological Sciences, Douglas Clark, Dean of the College of Chemistry, and of course, Jennifer Doudna. Chancellor. Thank you, Roque. I'm delighted to join this gathering today and to welcome a new Nobel laureate to Berkeley. As you all know, molecular and cell biology and chemistry professor Jennifer Doudna was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize uh, along with her colleague Emmanuel Charpentier from the Planck Institute in Berlin for the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, opening extraordinary new possibilities in agriculture and in, um, and in medicine. Uh, the, uh, someone from the Nobel organization said this morning that they had given us the tools to rewrite the code of life. Just an extraordinary discovery. We're so excited. I'm so excited that um, this is the first woman in Berkeley's history to have won the Nobel Prize, and indeed the second woman in two days from the University of California to have won a Nobel Prize. Jennifer, at this point in the ceremony, um, I present you with the most prized of all Berkeley perks, a free parking space. Um, so I expect you'll never have trouble parking on campus again. <laughs> And uh, seriously, I'm so thrilled with this extraordinary news. And now I'm going to turn the podium over to the Dean of the College of Chemistry, Douglas Clark. Thank you, Carol. As Dean of the College of Chemistry, I cannot imagine a more joyous occasion for the College of Chemistry and the entire Berkeley community as we welcome Berkeley's latest Nobel laureate, Professor Jennifer Doudna, into the ranks of scientific immortality. Jennifer's work, spirit, and leadership embody what is best about the scientific tradition and collegial culture of the College of Chemistry and of UC Berkeley. Few discoveries, even at the Nobel level, have had such a great impact in such a short time as the work of Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. Furthermore, Jennifer's work belies the notion that basic and applied research occupy different realms of knowledge. She has demonstrated in spectacular fashion that applied and basic research are not separate strands, but are woven together, much like DNA itself, to form the fabric of scientific endeavor. And in the process, combined structural analysis at the molecular level with biological insights to develop a transformational technology that is shaping the future of our world. So let me congratulate our newest Nobel laureate and say thank you to Jennifer for all you have done and all you will do. And drawing from a quote by another College of Chemistry Nobel laureate, Glenn Seaborg, commend you as you drive us towards a new level of excellence in all we do or try to achieve. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dean Michael Botchen. Thank you, Doug. The thrill I feel in congratulating Jennifer Doudna today for her Nobel Prize is shared by many folks all over the world. Here at Berkeley, faculty, students, and staff in her departments of molecular and cell biology and chemistry look to Jennifer as a role model for a university professor. She's brilliant in her thinking and generous in her time for others. Through the many decades of deep focus and basic research on RNA structure and the enzymes that contain both RNA and protein, she laid the groundwork 
for one of the most significant inventions of the 21st century, genome editing through the CRISPR-Cas system. Truly a crack in creation, pardon the uh, metaphor there. Uh, Jennifer's desire to harness the power of these inventions for the benefit of all is captured by this credo of the Innovative Genomics Institute uh, that she founded here at Berkeley. And let me read, read you this credo. We believe that science should serve the public good. Our work must realize the promise of genome engineering to advance human health and well being. We will create genome engineering solutions that meet an urgent need, serve a historically underserved community or advance technology to meet these ends. We will create new paradigms for commercializing genome engineering technologies that ensure broad, equitable access. We must always strive to maximize public benefit. Now that credo exemplifies Jennifer Doudna. And at this greatest of public universities, we are all very proud of her and her work I wish her all the best as she continues her groundbreaking work. We will be with her every step of the way, Fiat Lux. Jennifer, uh, I'm so thrilled to offer you the, uh, the stage now. Thank you very much to Roque, to Chancellor Christ, Dean Clark and Dean Botchen. I'm I'm over the moon, um, I'm in shock, and I couldn't be happier to be representing UC Berkeley. It's been a, an, an extraordinary time that I've had here, and I think that all of my colleagues know that, the, for me, the CRISPR work began with the work of Jillian Banfield, who is a, a distinguished faculty member at Berkeley, who was one of the very first to notice a, the signature of a bacterial immune system called CRISPR, and she brought it to my attention years ago so that we could begin investigating its actions. And that led to an extraordinary collaboration, international work that we did with Emmanuel Charpentier and our, our colleagues, Martin Yinnick, a postdoctoral associate here at Berkeley and Christoph Chylinski, a graduate student with Emmanuel. And that team did the work that is being uh, recognized today. And, and, and I would just say that it's, it's been a, an extraordinary uh, time to be involved in science, to be uh, working at a public university where we value education and the, we understand that the, the product of our, our labors has to benefit the public and, and the public good. I started the Innovative Genomics Institute as a partnership with my colleague, Jonathan Weissman at UCSF. And we began it uh, back maybe five years ago with the vision of bringing genome editing to bear on problems facing humanity, whether they be in biomedicine or in agriculture, and importantly, to do that with an eye towards affordability, accessibility, and sustainability that will make the technology go from a laboratory tool to a, a standard of care someday in, in genetic disease or a way to create the kinds of changes in agricultural products that will be necessary to, to meet uh, the challenges of climate change and so much more. So it's, um, it's been an amazing honor uh, to be here. And I, you, uh, you can probably imagine that I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really in shock uh, today, but I'm, I'm really proud to share this award with Emmanuel Charpentier, a, a wonderful scientist, um, you know, someone I, I really uh, value and, and have enjoyed working with over the years. And uh, you know we're uh, we're waving to each other across the Atlantic right now, but look forward to being together when that's possible again to to celebrate in person. And Chancellor Chris, thank you for that parking space. I'm I'm just you know now I can finally after 18 years I can park on campus. I'm I'm really delighted about that. <laughs> um, and I just want to again just give a shout out to to my colleagues, uh, to my my laboratory members and all of the students that I've worked with over the years, uh, especially here at Berkeley, it's, it's been uh, wonderful to be here. All right, well, thank you all for your comments. I am Roque Montez, Executive Director of Communications and Media Relations and Public Affairs. My colleague, Kara Menke and I will be moderating comments this morning. And before we open it up for that, just a couple of housekeeping notes. 
notes. Uh, please minimize your background noise. Please keep yourself on mute unless you're asking a question. And then finally, please submit your questions directly to Kara via the chat. And please include your name and your affiliation. We're going to try to get to all of your questions in the 45 minutes or so uh, that we have here. So be patient with us. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to open it up. Kara, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I see that uh, Tina Say, I'm, I hope I said your name right. Um, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Hi. Uh, yes, I do. It's Tina Say at Science News Magazine. Uh, uh, Dr. Doudna, I was wondering if you could sort of walk us through the insight and imagination it took to make this innovation that you and Dr. Charpentier are being honored for. Um, and, uh, you know, was there a eureka moment or was this uh, just a slow evolution? Thank you for the question, Tina. Thinking back on it, it really began with uh, you know a, a couple of years after I had moved my lab from Yale to, to Berkeley that I had a conversation with Jillian Banfield who told me about evidence for a bacterial immune system called CRISPR that her lab and just a handful of other folks uh, around the world had noticed. And um, at the time, there was no experimental evidence that this was in fact an immunity pathway in bacteria, but Jill, with her you know incredible scientific sense, had had the idea that this would be something very interesting for a biochemist like me to investigate, and that's how we got started on it. And then years later, uh, we we uh, I had the good fortune to meet Emmanuel Charpentier at a conference in 2011, and we decided there to start working together on one particular element in the CRISPR pathway called a, a protein called CRISPR-Cas9 that at the time was clearly important for protecting uh, bacteria from virus infection, but nobody knew well, how it worked. And so that was the question we set out to investigate. And in work that we did with our, our uh, my postdoc, Martin Yinnick in, in, in Berkeley and with Chris Chylinski, a student working with Emmanuel, we Pieced, you know, uh, started doing experiments and figured out that uh, this protein is able to cut DNA and importantly, that we could control where it cuts DNA by changing the molecule that guides it to a particular DNA sequence, a molecule of RNA, which has always been my, my expertise uh, working on RNA. And, um, and, and there really was kind of a eureka moment because uh, initially this was a curiosity driven project but at a key moment, uh, you know, Martin Yinnick in the lab had, had done experiments showing that not only could we control the DNA sequence where Cas9 would make its cut in the double helix, but also that we could engineer it to be a simpler system than what has been done in nature. And, and I think, you know, I, I remember that, that moment very, very clearly that, you know, Martin Yinnick was in my office and we were talking about his data and we looked at each other and we realized that this could be an extraordinary tool in other kinds of cells because of its ability to trigger DNA repair and thereby to trigger genome editing. And, um, and that really set us on a course uh, that you know, has, has um, you know, been just amazing over the last eight years uh, after publishing that original work in 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question will go to Daniel Trotta from Reuters. Daniel, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you very much. Um, my first two questions, if I may. My first is, uh, what do you make of the congratulations received from Eric Lander of the Broad Institute? And how will the Nobel Prize help in your patent dispute? Uh, and secondarily, um, what are your deepest ethical concerns uh, with people possibly abusing your findings and how can that be stopped? Thank you for your questions, Daniel. To the first question, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the, the acknowledgement from Eric Lander. It's, it's an honor to, to receive his, his words. And, and um, 
you know, I would just say that in any prize, there's, you know, in any any work of science, there are many people that that contribute along the way, and and uh, and that's certainly true in the case of CRISPR. Uh, how how will this affect the the ongoing patent dispute? Probably it won't. Uh, <laughs> um, but I I think you know I, I'm just pleased that the technology be, continues to be advancing quickly in, in many hands around the world. And we're seeing already some extraordinary opportunities to apply it to make people's lives better, including uh, folks that are affected by genetic disease. So that's, that's really what means a lot to me. To your second question about um, the risks of the technology, as you may know, I've been involved in it for several years in really um, encouraging an active global discussion about this. I'm pleased that uh, the National Academies and the Royal Society and other scientific societies, as well as governments, have really taken up this issue in a serious way. And we've seen even recently the release of a report that encourages global transparency as uh, groups around the world advance their work with CRISPR. So I think that's a, that's a key step in ensuring responsible use of the technology in the future. Great, uh, thank you. Next, we have uh, Lisa Krieger from the Mercury News. Lisa, could you please unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you and congratulations, uh, Jennifer. Is there anything unique about Berkeley and the San Francisco Bay Area that helped your research flourish? Thanks for your question, Lisa. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Berkeley is an extraordinary university in, in every way. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, melting pot of people who come here from around the world to do research and, and to think great thoughts uh, in, in all topics. Um, I, I'm amazed daily, really, to be a part of this incredible faculty and group of, of people that I've encountered here over the years. The other thing to appreciate is that we are located here in, in Berkeley, right in the middle of the Bay Area of California, where there are not only are other great universities close by, Stanford University, UCSF, UC Davis up the road, um, and then many other, other smaller schools, um, the, the you know, uh, state university uh, campuses, but also the um, extraordinary entrepreneurial uh, culture that exists in Silicon Valley that we're, that we're close to. So I think there really is a feeling here that uh, you, know, you should dream big and swing for the fences in, in, in your work. And I think many of our students that come to, to Berkeley, certainly that I've interacted with over the years, have that attitude of you know, wanting to do work that is important and will matter and, and that they feel real passion about. And it's that collaborative spirit that has always, uh, I think, meant a lot to me here and, and really has underscored everything that we've done, including the CRISPR work. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, next question, Liz Cooney from STAT. Liz, would you ask your question? Uh, yes, I'm happy to. I think you may have answered some of it, but you were mentioning contributions from your colleagues. You singled out Gillian Banfield in particular, and I'm thinking about the other CRISPR scientists who were not named by the Nobel Committee, and I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, and, and uh, if you could let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's, a, that's a really important point. There are many folks that have done critical work in the field over the years. I think back to the early days of the CRISPR field, which wasn't really that long ago, when uh, it was Jill Banfield who organized the first CRISPR conferences that were held uh, here actually at Berkeley. And we were talking on the phone this morning about the fact that in those days, you could fit everybody in the entire field in a, in a small conference room uh, on our campus. And, uh, and some of the folks that, that were there in those days uh, are key contributors to the field. Uh, uh, I, would, I would mention, you know, Rodolph Barango, of course, mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Sixness, yep. um, and uh, um, um, Eric Sondheimer, and Luciano Marafini, and um, um, there are many, many others, you know, Michael Turns. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of all of you right now. And, and I'm really grateful for that culture of uh, sharing and collaboration that we shared together in those early days, trying to make sense of, of this very interesting pathway in bacteria. Most people at that time, if we said, if, if I would go somewhere and say, I'm, I'm work on, working on a bacterial immune system, I got 
very puzzled looks of uh, why the heck would you do that? And, and it was nice to have colleagues that kind of got it in, in those days. And I, I really give a shout out to all of them. I think that you know it's been an amazing uh, field that's moved very quickly, largely because of that collaborative spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Molly Peterson from KQED had a question. She said her mic isn't working, so I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, if you could characterize your work a century from now, or if you could be characterizing your work a century from now, how would you imagine doing so? Well, thanks, Molly, for that question. If I try to think that far ahead, uh, yeah, it's hard because uh, things are, you know, obviously changing quickly. But, but I do feel that uh, the technology of CRISPR opens the door to so many um, things that we can now do both in our research laboratories as well as to address some of the urgent uh, problems that humanity is facing, whether it's in um, in human disease uh, or in uh, you know in in facing dealing with climate change. Uh, managing uh, our, our, our environment, all of these things are going to be, I think, affected by, by CRISPR. And uh, we're already seeing opportunities that are, are, are very real in uh, changing the lives of people that are affected by genetic disease, for example, for sickle cell disease, and I think there will be many others. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, here in California, we're seeing, you know, very, very, um, very real impacts of climate change that we're experiencing right now. And so that's a real motivator for me, certainly, to look for ways that we can use genome editing to help, uh, you know, whether it's giving bugs uh, better abilities to fix carbon or whether it's uh, giving plants abilities to deal with the effects of climate change. I mean, I think these are all things that are likely to come to pass. And uh, in 100 years, boy, uh, hard to say what will be going on. But I think, you know, just understanding that human beings now have the ability to rewrite the code of life and to do that in essentially all all organisms including ourselves is is you know is is, is quite extraordinary thank you um next question ben guarino from the washington post ben would you like to ask your question sure uh thank you and, and good morning uh nobel prizes in science have disproportionately gone to men. This is the first time that two women have, have shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry. What does that mean to you? And uh, what kind of message do you have to uh, young women who are interested in science? Well, thank you for that question. I, I, I would say I'm, I'm proud of my gender. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's great for especially younger women to see this and, and to see that uh, women's work can be can be recognized uh, as much as as men's. I think for many women, there's a feeling that no matter what they do, their work will never be recognized as it might be if if they were a man. And I'd like to see that change, of course. And I think this is a step in the right direction. I certainly hope that uh, you know I can uh, continue to encourage uh, my my students and especially my female students to embrace their their passion for their work and to to know that uh, their their work will be appreciated by broader society. So I, I really hope that's the message that comes through today. Thank you. Um, next question, um, Christina Larson from the Associated Press. Christina, could you ask your question? Oh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, oh, great. Um, I wondered if you could talk, Jennifer, about, well, first of all, congratulations. I wondered if you could talk a little bit specifically about which kind of, which inherited diseases you think CRISPR-related treatments may be most promising for in the near midterm future. Sure. Thanks for that question, Christina. I think in the near term, we're, and we're already seeing this, that um, folks that are affected with uh, genetic diseases of the blood will be treatable by CRISPR and sickle cell is, uh, is one, but there are, there are a, a number of others, as well as eye diseases. In fact, uh, John Flannery here at Berkeley is already uh, has experiments underway using CRISPR in the eye for treating genetic disease there. And, um, and those are both, uh, you know, a type of cell or tissue that tends to be easier to get the genome editing molecules into so that, you know, that they can actually have a benefit in someone's, uh, you know, sort of health uh, outcomes. 
And then in the longer term, uh, but maybe not too much longer, maybe within a few years, I hope, we will see opportunities in diseases like uh, muscular dystrophy and maybe even cystic fibrosis, where again, we understand well, very well the genetic cause of those diseases, but up until now, there hasn't been a way to correct the underlying genetic basis for that, for those diseases. And, and once it becomes possible to deliver gene editing molecules into the right cells, uh, for example, into muscle cells to treat muscular dystrophy, then I think that that's a, another very exciting uh, medical, biomedical uh, application of, of CRISPR. And then, of course, down the road, and something that I'm very passionate about with my colleagues at, at uh, the Innovative Genomics Institute and both Berkeley and UCSF and the Gladstone Institutes, we're working on neurodegenerative disease, which is probably farther out, but I think uh, there's a great need, and, and I think genome editing can be useful there as well. Thank you. Um, next, Clive Cookson from the Financial Times. Clive, could you ask your question? Yes, congratulations, Jennifer. I'd love you to talk a bit more about your transatlantic collaboration with Emmanuel, how you work together, how, you, how often you met, how you talked, how you developed this together, how much it was really a collaborative effort and um, whether you're still collaborating with her. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Clive. Yeah, it's, it's uh, great to think back on how that all got started because it, it really began with a meeting we had at, uh, at a conference in Puerto Rico. And uh, we, we, we had never met before. We had read each other's scientific articles, but uh, we hadn't met. And uh, in that, at that meeting, I remember it well, we walked around the old, old streets of old San Juan and, and talked about uh, CRISPR-Cas9 <laughs> and, and uh, how it would be really interesting to figure out what it might be doing in bacteria, how it worked. And we recognized at that meeting that we had complementary scientific expertise. Emmanuel is a, is a medical microbiologist and was doing a lot of work with organism, a particular organism that had uh, this, this kind of CRISPR system in the genome. And on my side, you know, we have, have for a long time worked on biochemistry, uh, uh, sort of taking a biochemical focus, understanding the molecular basis for genetic control, and especially um, looking at ways that RNA molecules control the flow of genetic information in, in cells. And that's a pretty broad topic, but we had focused on some particular examples in viruses and, and in human cells. And so uh, in any event, we started, we decided to work together. And, uh, and then uh, I, I was fortunate to recruit Martin Yinnick, who was already working in my lab at Berkeley to get involved in the project. And on Emmanuel's side, Chris Chylinski was the student who was working on the project. And lo and behold, the two of them uh, turned out to have uh, grown up on opposite sides of the Polish border. And they discovered this just uh, meeting on, it was Skype in those days, it was before Zoom. And, uh, and they spoke the same dialect of Polish. So that was a great cultural connection that they just happened to have and they really hit it off uh, that way. And we, we began communicating quite regularly, uh, mostly uh, by either email or occasionally by Skype. And I found Emmanuel to just be a really fun, person to work with, you know, she was very passionate and we would share ideas back and forth. And of course, as soon as we started to get some exciting data, then we were uh, talking more and more and more um, up into uh, all the way through, you know, writing, writing the uh, article that we published in, in 2012. So it, it was a, a wild ride, uh, you know, that, that whole experience. And then since then, our work has, has kind of diverged. You know, I think she really felt uh, the desire to go back to focusing on, on uh, bacterial pathogenesis and kind of some of the work that she had done um, earlier in, in her career and, and deepening that line of, of experimentation. And on my side, you know, we really wanted to explore the mechanisms of these CRISPR-Cas proteins. So we've maintained our, our contact over the years, but we found that our, you know, our work just kind of naturally diverged after that. Thanks very much. Next question, uh, Christina Horston from DPA. Could you please ask your question? 
Hi, yes, thank you. And congratulations, Professor Doubtna. My question would be, uh, how did you learn about the award this morning? What was the first thing you did afterwards and how are you planning to celebrate? Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I was uh, really deeply asleep, honestly, and I had my, my phone was on silent and um, I went to bed. I wasn't even thinking about the Nobel Prize. I just went to bed and, um, and uh, I, but I was awakened at, um, you know, just before 3 a.m. Uh, my phone was, was buzzing and for some reason it finally woke me up because it turns out it had been buzzing before that and I hadn't heard it. But anyway, I picked up the phone and it was uh, Heidi Ledford from um, Nature Magazine, who is a reporter who I, I know. And she wanted to know if I could comment on the Nobel and I said, well, um, who won it? <laughs> And she was shocked that she was the person to tell me. Um, so anyhow, anyhow, uh, I, right shortly after that, I, I talked to Martin Yinek, who called me from, from Switzerland, which was great, uh, really wonderful to talk with him. And M Emmanuel uh, texted me. And uh, yeah, and then I finally did uh, ha talk with uh, 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 Henrik at, at the Royal Swedish Academy and, and uh, heard the official news. And I told him I was very glad to know that it wasn't all a big joke. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, in terms of, so then I, I, I've been uh, just, you know, since then uh, uh, talking to my, my family and my sisters and uh, uh, cousins that I haven't talked to in a long time reached out and, you know, that's been really amazing. And of course, lots and lots and lots of colleagues and, and, and I've had a few phone calls with friends and things. And I'm planning to, uh, after this uh, press conference, I really want to go by my lab. And even though we have to be socially distanced, uh, I certainly want to say hi to, to uh, my students and my postdocs and technicians. I have a very long time uh, technician who's worked with me forever, uh, Kai Hong uh, Zhao and her husband, Enbo Ma. And I'm very eager, especially to see them because I know they will be really, um, really excited. And you know, we much of what we've done over the years, I really owe a huge debt uh, of gratitude to them as well. So I'm eager to, to see them. And then um, we're gonna have a Zoom, uh, uh, some kind of uh, celebration with our colleagues in, in both chemistry and, and MCB. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you. Um, Kat Snow from KQED. Kat, would you like to ask your question? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Kara. Um, Jennifer, congratulations to a fellow Sage, and I know Pomona must be super proud today of you as well. Um, and uh, so that's also really exciting. Would you talk a little more about what are the next um, significant steps that you're working on to assure the ethical use of gene editing and maybe specifically anything about challenges in the adoption of this transparency that you're, that you're glad to see beginning to, to be adopted, be, to happen? Thank you and greetings to a fellow Seichen. Um, I, I think that it's incredibly important that we um, as a scientific community that we, we ensure as to the extent possible uh, responsible use of CRISPR technology. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been very um, pleased at the international response. I think there's been a, a lot of interest in the topic and especially in the use of CRISPR in, in humans and in the human germline, uh, human embryos, but, but also for other things, you know, environmental applications is, a, is another big one where there's a lot of, um, you know, potential risk and, and important uh, stewardship that needs to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I just plan to continue working with the various groups now globally that are looking into this. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have an incredible group of colleagues again at Berkeley who are again, you know, deeply committed to this, uh, whether they are specialists in the law or in uh, uh, bioethics. We've had amazing opportunities over the years to interact about this topic and, you know, the Innovative Genomics Institute continues to uh, advance these goals of, of ensuring transparency. And, and in that regard, I think this, this most recent report that came out, I think takes an important step towards ensuring or at least uh, encouraging global transparency. It, as it calls for the establishment of international forums that will be responsible for, um, you know, kind of monitoring the, the use of CRISPR around the world and really making sure that scientists are in touch with each other and that, you know, if, if things are going on that, uh, that, that 
need to be brought to public attention that there's a now a very clear mechanism to, to do that. And I think that's that's really important. Thank you. Um, so my colleague has sent in uh, the next question from the YouTube live stream. Um, this question is from Sean Ryan at HHMI. Um, Sean asks, I wanted to ask if you have explored using other CRISPR slash CAS systems such as CAS-12 in genetic engineering and also congratulations. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, a short answer is yes. We're, we're very interested in the incredible diversity that we find in nature in these CRISPR-Cas systems. This is something that I've been working on for the past several years with uh, Jillian Banfield and her laboratory here at Berkeley. And then of course, with a number of, of other colleagues as well. And you know, it's, it's fascinating both from a, a, a fundamental science perspective of, of just understanding the you know, way that nature has evolved this very versatile system in bacteria to protect against viruses, maybe particularly interesting in the face of this you know, pandemic that we're dealing with right now. And then I also think that you know, these, some of these new or newer to us, at least CRISPR proteins are going to be useful as technologies because they offer things that, uh, you know, they offer, again, the kind of chemical uh, and, and biochemical diversity that will lend themselves to either better delivery into certain tissues or, um, you know, uh, particular activities that might be useful in depending on a, a specific biomedical or, or agricultural application that's desired for genome editing. So there's, I think there's a lot of good reason to study these for, for in both regards. And um, I look forward to continuing the, the work that we've been doing and, and hopefully to continuing to expand it with other colleagues as well. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Robin Schlenz from the UC Newsroom. Robin, would you like to ask your question? Hi, thank you. First of all, congratulations. UC stands for University of California, so you, we're all super proud of you and so excited. Um, how do you think that winning the Nobel at this point in time can help the field of gene editing develop? Thanks for the question. I think it will develop, the field is already developing very fast, so it's hard to imagine it going faster. However, I do think that it's possible that, um, that this, this recognition will attract other scientists to the field, perhaps, perhaps even folks that are not in the field right now, but would have you know, very interesting insights to bring to it. And they may be outside of, even outside of uh, you know, directly the, the areas of chemistry or, or molecular biology that we're talking about. Um, for example, I think it. I think it's very interesting to think about how to combine some of the advances happening in computing, in biostatistics, in big data analysis. Combining that with some of the kinds of data that are coming out of experiments using genome editing and CRISPR uh, will will be exciting. And uh, I've I've just started to have some of those conversations with uh, folks here in in the community here and and people that have actually reached out to me in recent days who are definitely outside the field, but very interested in getting involved in it. So possibly that will be something that, that gets now maybe accelerated by, by this recognition. Thank you. Um, looks like we are out of questions in the chat. Um, if any other reporters have questions, uh, please uh, let, my new, let me know. Either you can raise your hand or send me another question. Um, in the meantime, are there any questions from um, anyone else on the call? I had a quick one, Jennifer. It's not every day that someone wins a Nobel. You, of course, did. What changed? Or what will change for you? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I want to I give a big uh, shout out to my, my spouse and, and fellow Berkeley faculty member, Jamie Kate. Uh, Jamie is, is an extraordinary scientist and, and uh, you know, has been inspirational to me, certainly for my, my whole career. And we, we talk science every day at our house and now with our son, Andy, who's a freshman uh, here at Berkeley. 
Um, and I, I think that uh, you know we, we've we've uh, just barely scratched the surface of that that question uh, this morning. You know, talking about this a little bit early this morning. But you know, Jamie said to me, I think that you are going to be a real ambassador for for science and for especially for for women and younger uh, you know girls who are maybe thinking about a career in the STEM fields. And that you know you can serve an important role of inspiring uh, them to go forward with their their interests, and you know to some extent I've maybe been doing some of that already, but I, I think that that might uh, change or accelerate now with this this uh, recognition. And honestly, Roque, it's a real honor to to be in that role. It's a you know I, I know I've I've benefited over the many years from inspiring mentors, both male and female, and um, I'm I'm just. I'm delighted to inspire the next generation if possible. Fantastic, thank you for that answer. Um, we had another couple questions come in. Um, Clive Cookson from the Financial Times has another question. Thanks for taking a second question. From the Financial Times, I've got to ask you, Jennifer, about spin-out companies, the ones you're involved in, other commercialization efforts. Can you talk a bit about how you see it being exploited commercially, in a good way, of course? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Clive. As you know, there have been an extraordinary number of spin-out companies, um, you know, coming out of the CRISPR technology from from all over, and um, and and it's really exciting to see these companies starting to develop real, you know, we hope solutions in biomedicine and other areas using the technology. I'm a firm believer that that uh, you know, academic, what ac academic science is, is terrific at encouraging innovation and curiosity-driven research. I mean, that's what, certainly what we've always done in the lab. But I also appreciate that you know, there comes a point uh, when discoveries really need to be translated in a way that might be difficult or even impossible to do in an academic setting. And that's really where companies uh, come in. And I've been really fortunate to be part of a, you know, a few startups now, and uh, and and it's you know it's been a real again one of the big pleasures there for me is helping former lab members of mine and colleagues to to you know be founders of these companies in many cases uh, actually running running the companies in the case of several former students who are now doing this, and um, you know and then just to to kind of encourage them and, and help them in their work so. I'm, I, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of uh, companies getting spawned from, from the technology, and uh, it'll be exciting over the next few years as those uh, applications begin to come to fruition. And I'll just mention one more thing, Clive, and that is that, you know, I think at the Innovative Genomics Institute, we really want to make sure, as I mentioned before, and as, as Dean Botchin said at the beginning, that these uh, that the CRISPR technology becomes available and accessible and affordable to people that can benefit from it globally. And that's, that's really, I'll continue to, that'll be my sort of, continue to be my, my personal focus um, as these companies uh, develop and we hope we can partner with them as appropriate um, in different areas. Great, thanks again. Thank you. Uh, next question, um, Isam Ahmed from AFP. Isam, would you like to ask your question? Oh yeah, no, th thanks for doing this and congratulations um, on the Nobel. Um, I, I, obviously, you know, there's a lot of optimism around the field and, and rightly so, and, and, and given the tremendous uh, rate of discovery um, in, in, in recent years, but what are the sort of major technical challenges that could prevent some of these um, really sort of worthy lofty goals from actually, uh, what, what are the steps that, we, that, that, that are, uh, could prevent that from happening uh, quickly uh, in terms of climate, in terms of disease and so on? Right. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It's an important one, and um, you know the technology is still quite new, and so there we're still learning about it, and and there there are uh, definitely uh, challenges ahead. I would say the big ones are um, are include delivery, which I mentioned before, making sure that these genome editing molecules get get into the right cell types and tissue types that uh, where they can have a beneficial effect, whether it's in a human body or in a in an uh, some other uh, animal or, or a plant. This is a, a common challenge that, that we face right now in the field. 
And the second thing is ensuring that the genome editing that happens is, uh, is both effective and safe. And that inclu includes ensuring that it's accurate, um, ensuring that the gene or genes that are edited have, that those edits have the desired outcome over the long term in, in, a, in a person or a, a, some other organism. So those are all the kinds of experiments that are, I would say, ongoing right now in the field. And I think, uh, you know, in the future, we're also, the field is also really looking at ways to use the, the CRISPR tools in more sophisticated, I would say, kind of really, you know, precision kinds of ways that will enable, um, you know, very, very small uh, but accurate changes to be made to DNA consistently or to go in the other direction and be able to, you know, drop out or replace large segments of genetic information. And those are things that right now can be done in the laboratory, but are, you know, harder to do or maybe not really technically possible to do today in uh, cell types that would be clinically um, useful. So I think this, these are the areas where there, we'll see continued development. And I, I feel very optimistic, honestly, for the future. There's so much uh, work going on right now, so many uh, very clever, creative uh, labs and people that are working in the field that you know, we're seeing really rapid uh, advancements continually. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my colleague sent in a question from Deborah Netburn at the LA Times. Um, did you recognize immediately the significance of your discovery? Uh, thank you for that question. Well, yes, in the sense that I think it was immediately clear that having a programmable, easily, you know, uh, deployable system to alter the DNA of cells would be would be really exceptional. And and it partly is because of where the field was at the time that we did this work. It was already, you know, this is not the first or second or third uh, genome editing technology. It's somewhere farther down the line. But, but uh, so it was already clear that, you know, being able to manipulate DNA in cells would be, you know, incredibly enabling. Um, and, and, and I think what made CRISPR so, so, so clearly special is that it, it's, it's easily deployable. And you know, understanding the molecular basis of how it works as a bacterial defense system immediately for us really made it clear that this would be uh, you know, a very useful tool in, in other kinds of cells as, as well. That being said, you know, uh, people have asked, you know, did I, did I know that, you know, this moment was coming? I mean, of course not. And, and uh, you know, it's really always hard to predict where science is headed, um, but it's just been, you know, incredibly exciting over the last few years to see the developments of the technology. And I do often think back to that that day in my office with Martin, you know, looking at, at his data and looking at each other and saying, "Wow, if this works, it's you know, if this if this really uh, can be deployed widely as a genome editor, this is going to be incredible." And so, um, um, in that sense, um, I guess. I kind of had a feeling that, you know, it was going to be a, a big deal. Great. Thank you. Um, I see Tina Say has had her hand up. Tina, did you have another question? I did. I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, are there any uses of CRISPR that you didn't imagine when you, when you first developed this technology that have really surprised or delighted you? Well, I think it's been amazing to see how widely it's been utilized in different kinds of organisms. And you know, as a researcher, I guess one of the one of the really amazing and maybe in some ways surprising things is is just how quickly it's been deployed in organisms that you know certainly traditionally were not um, genetically tractable. So they certainly weren't being studied by scientists at a genetic level in the lab. And I'm thinking here in particular of uh, the study of butterflies. Um, you know, again, people here at Berkeley have, have been doing this, but elsewhere as well, you know, studying things like butterfly wing patterns using CRISPR technology to manipulate genes in very precise ways and figure out uh, how these wing patterns develop and what the genetics are behind it. In the past, that would have been possible to do only by observation of organisms in the wild, and now you know we can we can make these kinds of manipulations and study it. 
uh, in a in a real scientific sense. And then, um, and the other example that comes to mind is is uh, the study of bipedalism. So there's a you know wonderful project going on uh, right now in in a, a Pew Scholar lab of a Pew Scholar who's been looking at uh, the emergence of of how you know how we walk on two legs and 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 really trying to dissect the genetics of that using. Um, small rodents as a as a model um, of this, and using CRISPR to dissect the the genes that are involved. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, uh, who would have thunk it? Um, and and uh, and I think, you know, in general, I would just say that, you know, the opportunities to use a tool like this to ask questions in in a, in a research setting that would have been, you know, impossible or certainly extremely difficult to 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 do in the past has been incredibly exciting and, and gratifying over the last few years. Thank you. Um, my colleague, Will Kane um, from the UC Berkeley News site sent in a question. Um, this is UC Berkeley's second Nobel Prize win in two days. What does that mean to you? And what do you think it means to Berkeley staff, students? What do you think Berkeley's students, staff, and faculty should take away from these two wins? Berkeley's an awesome place. But we already knew that. <laughs> it's just an amazing, amazing environment. It's I think we all we all knew this already. Uh, so they didn't they didn't need to be told this by the Nobel Committee. But uh, but I think you know we all take away that uh, it just underscores the fact that we're 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 very fortunate to work in this community in this environment under the leadership that we have and the with the just exceptional colleagues and and staff and students that that we have working here. And um, you know I just. I think it's a nice opportunity to just take a step back and take a breath with all of the things going on and, and just remember and be grateful for what we have. You know, I think that feeling of gratitude for me is, is often very helpful when we're facing uh, stresses, you know, locally or, or nationally or internationally that we just take a moment and say, you know, we're, we, we work at an extraordinary place and these, these prizes just, just, you know, underscore that. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we've got just a couple minutes left and just wanted to make certain that there were no other questions on the floor. And if there are not, I had one quick question that I wanted to pose to you, Jennifer, the chancellor and uh, deans, Mike Botchin and Douglas Clark. And it is this, um, it's been an incredibly momentous 48 hours not only on the Berkeley campus, where again, congratulations, Jennifer, um, for uh, being awarded the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, but yesterday as well, um, when Reinhard Ginzel took the prize to share the prize uh, in, in physics. Again, Jennifer, we mentioned at the top that you're the first woman uh, faculty to ever win a Nobel on campus. And then it was mentioned earlier that this is the first time that two women have won a Nobel Prize in science together. That in addition to the win in UCLA. I'm wondering if you all could put this in perspective for us in terms of just how amazing this moment actually is. And that's Looks open like to all of you. You start, okay. <laughs> Go I, I would love to hear from others what your thoughts are. <laughs> well, let me jump in and just say that it's it's sort of it, it's reassuring to know that there's still joy in the world and that you know given the chaos that we now have with the pandemic and our political system and our our fight against racism that uh, we we can see a public institution that have folks like Jennifer Doudna and Jillian Bainfield here who represent the best uh, and I just what what will remain with me for a long time is Jennifer's comment uh, that she's proud of her gender well we're pr I'm proud of the, of your gender as well but I'm proud of the human race in the end and the arc of history is definitely going up well, Claude, this is uh, Deepak Srivastava, president of the Gladstone Institutes, where Jennifer runs a second lab. Yes. On your, on your question, uh, Jennifer knows I've got two teenage daughters, and they have been so inspired for so many years uh, by what they observe with Jennifer. And I, 
they're an example of so millions of gr young girls out there uh, that uh, will pursue science because of Jennifer and Emmanuel and so many other great uh, women scientists. So thank you, Jennifer, and congratulations. Yes, absolutely, thank you. And, and I would just add that this is indeed a groundbreaking first, and we're all just so very, very proud to be associated with it, but it will not be the last time that it occurs. <laughs> uh, it, thanks in, in large part to the inspirational example that Jennifer has set for all of us. I think what's extraordinary is the range that these two prizes represent. In just two days, we have scientists awarded the Nobel for understanding the black or beginning to understand the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So the farthest reaches of the cosmos to the my, most minute mechanisms within um, what the Nobel committee was calling the code of life. I think that's extraordinary. And I'm so grateful that the University of California has um, a, an extraordinary role in these discoveries and particularly the women on the faculty of the University of California. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Mike Botchin and Douglas Clark, and certainly Jennifer Doudna. We are at the top of the hour, which means we are at the end of our time. Wanted to thank you all for your participation, your fantastic questions, and I could not end this without saying, go Bears. Thank you all. Thank you, Raja. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.